It's such a pleasure to be back at NFT NYC, um, this time joined by my very distinguished colleagues, Brendan Burns and Dr. Lauren Rotenberg. The three of us are actually connected through Sotheby's Institute of Art, where Brendan is currently the co-founder of the Enterprise Studio. Lauren is former London faculty, and I was the New York art and tech lead. Each of us have one foot in academia. I am now faculty at the Cooper Union. Brendan is faculty and a director at the Columbia Business School. And Lauren has taught extensively in the UK. Yet we also come to this panel with very different perspectives on emerging tech based on our experiences in the art market and other creative industries. Brendan is the founder and CEO of CME, which is a company dedicated to fostering art sales by connecting international artists of every level with collectors through advanced AI search techniques. Lauren was the co-founder and CEO of an art NFT marketplace and has advised projects at the Tate Britain, Gasworks, and Camden Art Center, although she is now focused on institutional advisory in the art and Web3 space. On art and high tech, I, as an art historian and a data scientist, have advised entities such as the Frick Collection and Art Reference Library, the Government of France, the US Defense Innovation Accelerator, and UNESCO. I have also been an expert consultant for Unit 9 Production and the Campari Group for the AI-inspired film Fellini Forward, and created the Gastronomic Algorithms Project for Chef Alain Passard of the restaurant L'Arpège in Paris. Um, I should also add that I've been working on AI uh, since really 2012, um, and uh, was uh, a long collaborator with uh, Professor Ahmed Elgamal at Rutgers University. And um, back actually in 2017, I created the first deep learning fueled AI art exhibition with the ICANN algorithm. So in our session today, I am delighted to bring each of our unique perspectives into play on the relationship between generative AI and NFTs in the art world. And this is in part somewhat selfish because I'm currently writing a book on generative AI and ethics. <laughs> At the most fundamental level, we want to address the paradox presented by NFTs and generative AI art. Broadly stated, DLTs have become synonymous with transparency, authenticity, authentication, valuation, and ownership, whereas generative AI by definition presents a challenge to these concepts. How do we grapple with the use of AI art on the blockchain? Does AI art with its unclear authorship, lack of interpretability, and unclear intellectual property and legal status find any resolution to its murky state of being when minted as an NFT? Given the boon and attention to the potential use of AI techniques across industries, what is the current state of generative AI art and the art market and how it is developing. And before I turn the first question to Brendan, I just wonder if I could, we could request that the door be closed since it's a little noisy. Thank you. So, so Brendan, what do you make of the blockchain AI paradox and what do you see at play from your perspective as a long-standing tech entrepreneur and economist? Uh, thanks, Emily. Uh, thanks, Emily. Uh, I, I want to just say first, um, it's a great pleasure to be up here with two uh, highly credentialed and uh, extremely insightful women. Um, and I, I, I do think about almost every framework across uh, a history, my, certainly my own personal history, but then where things are going. And But the lens that I always try to bring is rather than predicting what's going to happen in the future, it, it's an effort to see the present for what it really is. And it strikes me that um, w things are speeding up for sure, but that they, this, this paradox is really a tension that we see playing out across all levels of society. And I'm not so sure that um, it, it's, it's a true paradox or rather a tension 
between an effort to solve problems uh, in the form of um, distributed ledger technology and AI, which is a rapid generative AI in art, which is a rapid uh, iteration on what has already occurred and even very recently. So the, where, where we're gonna go, I, I'm not really sure yet. I'm really just trying to gain clarity, um, but there are lots of examples that help us contrast these things. Uh, Lauren, um, could you tell us your thoughts on the paradox? And I know, I know you have some strong feelings about AI art as a movement. I'd love to hear about that. Okay, thank you. Um, first off, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here and joining us. Um, just to be clear in terms of this paradox, I think just defining it a little bit more, it's that on the one hand, the value proposition of blockchain is that it makes verification better, faster, cheaper, that you know what happened actually happened, and there's this immutable, supposedly immutable blockchain record where everything can be traced and tracked. So it's creating a historical record that is quote unquote irrefutable. And that in some ways is more historical looking. But then on the other hand, you have AI, which fundamentally makes prediction better, faster, cheaper through mass data sets. So it's forward looking. And I think what is often forgotten here is that just because something was put on the blockchain in the first place doesn't mean it was authentic in the first place. And people celebrate the authenticity and the originality and the traceability. But you know, it's the old thing with coding, like garbage in, garbage out. So how do you even know from the beginning that what was put in was authentic? So that's kind of the first issue. The second is, what is authenticity? Like in an age of AI where predictions and, you know, I spent a lot of time in conversation before this panel with ChatGPT, you know, thinking about what is the role of the expert in the age of AI and where is it getting its information from? You know, lots of questions I was asking it. I think part of that paradox is like, from an arts perspective also, who is the author? Who is the creator? And how are we thinking about originality and creation in an age where that is so facilitated by um, predictive algorithms and generated work that's auto-generated? You know, and from an art perspective, the creator is essential. Um, just in terms of the movement question that you asked, so there's a lot of, conversation about what this means, but I, I personally think that it's kind of a ism to some extent. Like AI is a new medium. It's as disruptive as photography was in the 19th century in terms of thinking about what artists need to do. They no longer need to paint realistically because a camera can capture that. So what is the role of artists? Similarly, you know, AI can generate work. So also what is the role of artists in creativity and authorship? So in that respect, I think that we can already look at early NFT work as a kind of movement in an accelerated format, like the crypto 90s aesthetic um, moment, that of the punks, that of the apes, like that is already now like a historical moment. The market has bottomed out, the industry has moved past that. And I think to some extent, this work that we're seeing now produced by AI will also be an ism. It'll be a moment of looking at a specific aesthetic and modality of working that we will look past at, while at the same time, AI continues to be a tool that is used in ways that artists are making work. You know, you really have great colleagues when you can productively disagree with them. <laughs> and so one of, one of my points of uh, contention with, with what you've said there, as you know, is that I really see the future of AI art as not being defined separately from digital art or art in general, art, art just at large, but really it's all about the seamless integration of things. I really see um, what is happening right now to be necessary to be defined as such. And yes, indeed, there are already historical recognitions of things like uh, rare Pepe the Frog memes and, and, and what have you. However, I really think that the new direction is the seamless integration, multimodality. Um, I'm thinking actually of um, Rafi Ganadal's artwork right now on display at MoMA, unsupervised. If you have a chance to check it out, it's very worthwhile. 
but we see an interest in really bringing together not only the visual experience of data in our uh, vast data archives of the world today, but also how it is that we sort of embody then those spaces outside of just a screen. How do we bring music into it? How do we bring other sensory experiences to that? And so I really see that the future is very much about how these things wind together and they won't be called separately NFT art or AI art, it will just be art. Um, but turning actually to specific examples, um, I'd like to um, ask Brendan a question about generative AI. And um, with CME, I know that you've had a number of competitions. I, I was very lucky to be a judge in, in one of them um, and saw incredible works of art. However, I was confused at certain points as to what degree of generative AI was actually um, displayed in, um, in some of those artworks. And so there's a question I think that emerges here as to, to what, what, what degree do artists have to actually disclose for a competition, for instance, that they are using these tools? Is it an all or nothing equation? Um, should there be standards? Um, are those developing? Would those be enforceable? Emily, it's a great, um, it's a great question and I think an important point to clarify. Uh, let me say first, yes, there should be standards. They should be very clear, and they should be, uh, those standards should be captured and codified on Ledger, in my, in my opinion. So the, and, and I want to um, kind of differentiate between the Ledger problem or issue and, or what they solve and uh, AI as a tool of um, creativity and maybe um, multimodal collaboration between lots and lots of people. From, and this is the way we think about it at CME, is I think the most effective uh, uh, solution to the long-term challenge, which is how to establish a real good record for art and to track it over time, is capturing it at origination. I'm personally not really interested in you know, the problem around um, all the the art-denominated assets in the world that are already out there, I want to help artists at the point of origination because I know in five years and ten years that you'll will impact way more people. Okay, by doing that. On the second point, though, I think you have to um, require people from both an ethical and, and factual perspective to say, here's the extent to which we're using AI, here's how um, it impacts it, and make that very clear to everybody involved. Um, Lauren, in your work with um, institutional partners, um, where do you see generative AI coming into play? Okay, I'll address that in one second, but I just want to respond to what Brendan said. Like, What's interesting is that we want this disclosure, even outside of art, right? You want to know if you're talking to a bot or if you're talking to a human, and I think that we have sort of the right to know, which I respectfully say goes against your point of seamless integration, because otherwise, why would you need to disclose if it can just be all together, right? I was last, yesterday, I was at the NFT gallery um, in Soho that's having an exhibition on AI generative art and memory. And I asked the gallerists there if they felt they need to disclose that the work is made with AI, and they said, absolutely. So the ethics around that and like how that ends up being used as a tool in creativity, I think for right now, we're just at a stage where it's a little bit scary, and 100% we want to know what was done by the artist and what, what wasn't, you know, what was generated. If, if I can add, it's, 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 it's fluid, and it can seem kind of scary to us with our slow human minds. But, but in fact, people are working on the problem of uh, efficiently capturing editable actions on Ledger for um, processes or art that's happening in a generative fashion. Mm. And I don't want to speak out of step, but I see like Nadia's in the room, and she was she was um, had an amazing hi, had an amazing project with her artist called Heterogenesis, and that was an amazing generative work where, again, using the trope of the seed or the flower. Um, they have latent qualities in them, and then as collectors choose to combine them, they, they turn into something else, and that's done by algorithms and is sort of determined. There is also an element of chance, but those are thinking about AI generative projects where they're way more participatory because collectors are becoming co-creators in the work. They are subject to chance because even though they're using AI, you can't predict which collectors are going to interact with each other, which seeds will end up 
um, hybridizing into a new flower, what traits will be combined. So I think that those projects are super interesting, but I also think they represent a certain kind of modality and moment in the kind of new history of art that's being created now. To address your question about institutions, so I'm working right now with a lot of museums and helping them figure out their NFT and Web3, like what this means for them. There's a whole bunch of interesting questions around that. Uh, to be honest, they're not even, the ones I'm working with are not even thinking about AI yet. Like AI has just sort of exploded more recently and it's still a little bit of trying to figure out how, does, how do NFTs, how does Web3 mean for the museum towards sustainability and like engaging communities? And for all of us who have been working on AI for a long time, <laughs> that seems so surprising, but such an interesting point to make, absolutely. So we also just wanted to um, bring attention to the fact that, um, of course, there's this petition that's been going around, um, Elon Musk's name all over it, um, with a, um, a call to actually halt research on AI for six months. And there's also been a counter petition um, uh, from Stability Diffusion, actually their not-for-profit arm as well, to keep innovation in AI going and research going. And so we wanted to just sort of recognize that that's going on and each give our perspectives on um, the, the dueling petitions. Um, I'd like to sort of just sort of own the fact that I think it's very important that we continue doing research in AI. We have to do so with an ethical framework and keep those questions uh, first and foremost. But the idea of stopping research altogether is, uh, I think, very impractical and um, also just not good for research and innovation. I also want to point out that there are um, a lot of um, institutional problems with the way that these large AI companies are working in regard to how they're managing the not-for-profit arm of their businesses. And I'm expecting that there will actually be um, forthcoming uh, lawsuits about that where you basically have um, an inherent kind of problem with, on the one hand, creating a not-for-profit education company where you're gathering data, scraping the web for information, um, text and visual, and then you're then your for-profit company is then tapping into that and saying they're, no, they're not responsible for then what has already been assembled into these data sets. So I think that, that the not-for-profit profit, profit um, side of this needs to be worked out, especially with uh, uh, open AI and stability diffusion. And um, I uh, also wanted to just point out that the Getty Images lawsuit that's at play right now, where it's very clear that you have um, these AI companies actually taking data sets that they don't have permission to use. Um, they're absolutely using that because the watermark itself is being reproduced in the generative AI images, which is trademark infringement and many other, uh, many other things as well. And I do predict that Getty Images will, will win that case. Um, so I wanted to just get your sense of the petitions and innovation in the space, should we from the art side of things be calling for a slowing down of things or uh, where do you see this, Brendan? I, I think um, as a mechanism to raise awareness and really um, spice up the conversation and get more people engaged, it's a, it's a really good, uh, it's, it's really good fuel for debate. As a practical matter, I think it's naive and will amount to nothing. You know, and, and the cat, I mean, the cat's out of the bag already. I think uh, a couple days ago, um, Stanford's um, AI Research Center uh, just released the results of a study where they were using generative agents in simulated, um, in simulated environments to, um, to basically affect human behavior and actions. It's, it's, it's on the internet now. It hasn't been widely circulated yet, but people should look at it. It's super, super interesting. The bottom line is the cat's out of the bag. And it's not going to go back, and efforts to do that, I think, are a waste of energy, uh, personally. Yeah. No, that, that plays right into this idea of a declaration of rights related to AI that the uh, US uh, Department of Technology. That's more constructive. Yeah. Than, than 
the blueprint, um, which is also um, very vague, not enforceable, um, but certainly shows sort of an awareness. And if I can make one, one quick editorial comment, which is that we've seen this happen in every other prior uh, uh, technical innovation where the, the status quo, um, the, the people who benefit from the status quo have basically sounded the inar alarms and said this is going to change our way of life. And in every single, every single case without exception, they've been steamrolled to their detriment. And you, you have to lean into change. It is the only way to survive and innovate. That's not to say it should be at, at all costs, but you have to figure out how to do that. And, and of course, then we see the, the United States taking a very different angle with this, more of a hands-off approach, all of these ideas of what to do, but actually not creating the legislation yet, the regulation's not there yet, whereas the UK has moved pretty quickly with that, and the European Union is sort of a, a more of a middle ground. But certainly, I think we need to continue looking at Europe because they are the movers and shakers with everything um, ethics, regulation, policy related right now. Uh, more, more progressive institutional approach like to cultural institutions and, and stuff like that than, than North America, frankly. I don't have strong comments on this. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, um, we're, we're quickly running out of time here. So what I'd like to, um, to ask you guys is, um, it's sort of to comment on what I would call the unintended consequences of what generative AI and um, its relationship to the blockchain presents in terms of the larger cultural manifestations of this sort of extreme interest in um, digital things and the possibilities of what AI represents. Just as there's so much hype and attention to the role of emerging tech in the arts, there is another side to this. And I think that each of us has separately observed that there's a growing appreciation for the makers movement. I see this as a very kind of organic, grassroots, arts and crafts and decorative arts sort of celebration that's happening right now. So what are, what are your views on the unintended consequences of this, to use uh, uh, Edward Tenor's uh, term? And um, I, I actually think that, I, I personally will just say that I see that there's already a lot of um, interesting uses of generative AI besides the plant project that's already been mentioned. Um, I'm thinking of Mario Klingemann's work, uh, uh, Bestiary, for instance, which is all about seemingly organic animal forms morphing one into the next. Um, what is then the role also of the of the generative AI art space in sort of picking up on this organic grassroots makers movement? What, what are your thoughts on this? Okay, I have a few things that I feel like in the last minute I just kind of wanna say, which are, I think it's important to really remember, especially in the context of an NFT NYC conference that the powers that be and segments of the art world really do not want the value proposition of blockchain, of price transparency, of provenance records. I work with a lot of collectors who are very secretive. It is still a backroom handshake culture. You know, a collector I work with will not touch a work that's even seen on the open market. And price transparency and, you know, this tracking that is so celebrated there is a huge um, resistance to that inherently in the way that the art market operates, and I think that that's something to remember. Uh, not saying it won't change, but the promise of disruption that tech has been proposing, you know, in London, I saw all these companies come in, we're gonna disrupt the art world. The reality is that it's like the largest unregulated legal industry in the world. Um, it's very resistant to technology. COVID was a catalyst for change, but, it's not eager for these changes. And also the thing to remember is that questions of originality and authorship, these actually aren't big problems. Like we think they're big problems because fakes and forgeries and things like that make the news, but the reality is that like they're not painkiller type problems in the art world that need to be solved. Brendan, do you wanna um, have a comment on that as well? I, I, I agree with Lauren on that. They, they are not these um, major problems. I actually think that um, human intervention will end up driving um, a perception of scarcity and value preservation over time, um, and will create and will actually enhance categories. So, 
I just want to thank both of you so much for agreeing to do this panel. And thank you so much to the audience and to the organizers and volunteers of NFT NYC. We really appreciate being here and would love to talk to you after this session. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Emily.